Okay. Well, this is Dr. Morton, and this is the uh, this is the uh, lecture for digital systems design for the 26th of October. So this semester is rapidly pushing to the end. Uh, so this week, um, so the next two labs are pretty straightforward, um, and anyway, I, I so. So I, I'd like you to do them, but you don't have to spend a ton of time doing them. They should be pr really, they should be pretty straightforward for you. So, um, so we'll see. But hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to get them done. Um, what I may do is, and maybe I, what I what I think I'll probably do is is let you look at the two labs and just pick one of them and do one. You can do them both if you want, but you only have to turn in one of them. And as a result, uh, we're going to try and get started on the final projects a little earlier. Um, just because I know after Thanksgiving they're going to kind of restrict access to the campus, I think. So uh, there won't be a lot of debugging help. So I think we probably need to get started on the on the project really probably this week. So so we'll just pick one of those labs, and that'll be that'll be the uh, that well I think we'll still try and do the SDK lab, but I'm not gonna I'm gonna make that uh, I want you at least attempt it. Uh, and so if you just turn in. Um, that you at least attempted it. Uh, you don't have to actually get it working, but I, I do want you to read through it and sort of understand how the procedure works for creating a soft core on your uh, on your board and then actually programming it. Um, and it turns out you use Vivado to sort of set things up, and then you use the SDK uh, tool to actually um, to actually program it. So anyway, so we're going to try and do that. It, it can be a little tricky, and sometimes people have troubles with it, but you should do fine. The one thing you do have to have is the, you, you do have to have the board file loaded for it to work properly. And so, if you haven't loaded the board file in your in your uh, you know in your version of Vivado, then that's going to be a problem. I'm pretty sure the board file is loaded uh, on the ones in in the the lab because uh, I know we talked about that. So anyway. So we'll try and we'll try and get that done uh, because I think I'd like to at least expose you to the SDK lab, um, and then uh, so so really we just have two more labs. So your pick of either eight or nine, and then the SDK lab, and the SDK lab you don't have to fully complete it. Uh, I just really want you to turn in the data sheet for that. But making it you should make an attempt because there's that that's an important lab. There's a lot you can learn from it. There's actually. I think there are two SDK labs actually on Blackboard, and you can do both of them if you want, but um, but you only have to really attempt one of them. Okay, moving forward. So uh, so if we look at the syllabus, you will see, and I'm gonna I'll shrink me down here a little bit, uh, maybe even more than that. Okay, and then we'll put me up here, maybe even a little over here. Okay, that would be good. All right, here's the data sheet. Um, so we're on the 26th here, and we're supposed to cover, we're supposed to be finishing unit eight, but we've already finished it. So uh, I'll go ahead and start nine, and um, then on Wednesday uh, we'll review for, the, we'll start reviewing for the second written test, and um, and uh, we might or might not have a lecture for Friday, uh, and. Once we finish uh, unit nine, I think I don't. I think that's it. I don't think there's actually. Oh, maybe there is a there. There is a unit ten too, but once we finish unit nine and ten, we'll be th we'll be through with the whole book, and uh, I might do some of these special topics, and I may not. I, I'm going to kind of try and slow the course down because I really want you to focus on the final project because I feel that's what you'll where you'll really uh, you know kind of. Uh, it'll be the capstone for for feeling that you can write very log code, and I that's that's kind of the important thing I want you to get out of this. Okay, that having not that having been said, we're going to talk about hardware testing and design for test design for testability. Now, uh, this is a really big deal uh, for any of you who who've done any internships, you've worked a little bit in industry, you know testing is a big deal, and you know that. Uh, a lot of times what they do, they, they assign the junior person 
to do some of the testing. It's a good way to get your feet wet, and uh, it's a good way to uh, to sort of uh, learn the business of the company that you're working for without being in a position to do too much damage. Um, so that's a lot of times why they do that. And then after you've worked there for a while uh, and they see that you're kind of achieving a level of competence and, uh, and sort of knowledge and background and you kind of know what's going on, then at that point uh, they start moving you on to more uh, specific things. All right, so we're going to go through this. This is really important topic. We're, uh, it, it's, you, know, you could probably do multiple courses on, on testing uh, and design for testability. These are really important things, but uh, we're going to try and cover them somewhat generically. Okay, uh, let's see, and I'm, I'm not going to go over, I kind of already talked about this. I, I'll probably uh, just go over a real specific schedule of how we're going to finish the semester and when you're going to, when we're going to have you present your um, projects and whatnot. And how, probably the format for that is going to be to record a short video demonstrating your project, uh, kind of like you've been doing for the labs if you're not doing them in person. All right, so we're going to talk about testing combinational logic, testing sequential logic, we're going to talk about scan testing, boundary scan, and built-in self-test. Uh, so these are the these are. There's a lot more testing than this. Uh, there's testing that occurs when printed circuit boards are made. There's testing that that's occur that occurs when printed circuit boards are populated and the components are soldered on. Uh, there's testing that's that occurs when the full uh, device is assembled and ready for shipping. Uh, there's a whole whole host of testing that gets done. Uh, and, and, and certainly testing of actual chips and uh, programmable devices. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different things to get tested and there's a lot of different testing issues. And we're only going to cover some of these. So, um, so when, when, uh, when you manufacture something, it does, it, it's possible for there to be problems with the manufactured product. And uh, it's really good uh, to uh, detect defective products before they get shipped. Because uh, when you ship a defective product, it, it, definitely, uh, it definitely has an impact on your company's, uh, or can have uh, an impact on your company's prestige. And it can also have a, a big impact on your company's uh, profits. Uh, so getting things right is super important. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that testing can, uh, that, well, defects can be introduced. And one of the reasons why you need to do testing. Uh, when you manufacture something, there can be a dust particle on a photo mass that causes all sorts of problems. There can be, uh, there can be a, a metal via that, uh, that doesn't get done properly and, and, uh, and causes a, a, a defect where a connection uh, doesn't get made. There can be uh, components when you when the board goes through the reflow, reflow oven that uh, that get soldered on inappropriately. One one of the things that happen is this thing called tombstoning, where a uh, a part will stand up on its end instead of uh, lying flat on the board. Um, I can probably show you an example of that. If you look here, you'll see um, a printed circuit board, uh, and you can see. Here's the component lying down across its pad. And note these, these right here are standing up uh, and they should be laying down flat across the pad, but instead they're standing uh, straight up. Uh, and actually, I think this one flipped over and soldered on the wrong side. Uh, and it has to do with surface tension. It, if uh, these small parts, let's see, I think I can blow it up even. Uh, these small parts, uh, if the solder melts here on one end first, and that creates a lot of surface tension, this part's small enough that it can just cause it to essentially uh, be pulled into an upright position. Um, and we call that tombstoning because it looks like a, you know, a grave marker instead of lying down flat. So that's tombstoning. And uh, in, the, in my reflow oven where we've made the boards for Micro One, uh, we run 100 boards. We'll probably have one or two uh, of the resistors or capacitors tombstone for us. So we have to check them. All right, so anyway, so you definitely have to test hardware before you uh, sell it to the customer. 
uh, otherwise it does affect your your reputation quite a bit okay so there's several pieces to it one of them is verifying that your design is correct uh, so you can introduce errors and problems at the beginning in your design so that even from that point on if everything is done perfectly you still have a defective product because your original design had a had a logic error in it um, and that's one of the reasons why we simulate and that's one of the reasons why I stress the test bench in this course it's really good to, to do that because anything you do in industry you're going to be you're going to have a test bench and you're going to be making triple double sure that your algorithm is correct and that it works for uh, that you can test it pretty exhaustively you may not be able to test it completely exhaustively just because of time but you certainly want to run it through a lot of different options um, okay and uh, in your sequential design you want to look at you want to look at all your states uh, and try and make sure there's just no errors built in uh, in the manufacturing side you you want to you want to make sure that the manufactured part matches what you designed uh, and you will probably have exam you'll you'll have steps in the process where you will look at uh, at at your parts as they're uh, created and assembled for instance uh, uh, one of my friends uh, has a, 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 a medical device company and uh, he's uh, well he works for it and and one of, one of the one of their pieces of equipment has a printed circuit board in it and I went with him to the uh, to the company that manufactures their printed circuit boards and part of their contract not only do they are they to manufacture the boards but they do this testing and uh, and they uh, they have a number of different ways they do it but one of the ways they do it is they use what's called a flying needle and so they they actually uh, they actually have uh, uh, a couple of probes they look like needles they're pretty sharp and very small and they they move across the board and they measure uh, resistances and capacitances in a number of different locations maybe a hundred different locations uh, and they and they uh, basically they can detect if a parts missing or if the wrong part was soldered on or if there's some uh, defect in the way it was soldered on and and they can detect that that parts messed up now you can't uh, if you want to get even more um, detailed than that then you can you can do even more extensive testing where you apply voltages uh, to the wires you create the electrical environment that the parts supposed to operate in and then you see if it's doing what it's supposed to do in that environment uh, it's a little more extensive than the tests they're doing uh, they're just uh, they're just probing really with two two needles kind of the before and after points and then they may have a few devices where they can do three needles I don't know I don't remember but uh, but in any event uh, you can also have a inspection system that just just does a visual uh, inspection it takes basically it takes a it has a television camera looks at the board uh, and can, can compares it uh, against a stock you know a, a, the standard image that what it's supposed to look like and and if it de detects some variation between the standard image and the current image then it can highlight areas for you to double check um, this ex this 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 uh, testing is pretty extensive and and in many cases it takes almost as long to uh, to ins to inspect one of these boards as it does to manufacture these boards uh, especially when you can manufacture a bunch of them all at once but you could you have to test them individually unless you have multiple testers and these testers are expensive pieces of equipment um, because they have to be able to see the board they have to have uh, vision guidance with uh, television cameras and then they have to have they have to be all set up you have to basically define all the places you want probed and what the what the what the uh, range on the allowable measurements is and when the measurements are out of spec uh, you know what you want done with the board at that point so there these are very complicated inspection algorithms to set up and not to mention that the piece of equipment is quite expensive too maybe a hundred thousand dollars or more um, all right um, in the old days we used to do well with integrated circuits in the old days they used to do what was called a bed of nails 
and they would actually they could actually put little miniature needle probes onto the chip and measure different parts and different uh, different uh, different functions of the chip before they would uh, uh, saw them apart and bond them with bonding wires to to their you know to their final uh, uh, form. Well, those are super expensive, and now that the chips have gotten uh, now now that we're doing 10 nanometer feature size, the there's no no ability to uh, to probe those with a bed of nails anymore. Uh, they're just too the pitches are just too fine. You can't do it. Uh, so some of the things we used to do are just not practical anymore. Not possible. Um, we have this for combinational logic. We have this thing called the fault model, and uh, and the fault model basically uh, uh, tries to assess. Uh, if there's an error in the circuit, what what impact will it have on the output values? And there there are two basic uh, the basic fault model is it the stuck at model. In other words, you let's say you make an AND gate, and the AND gate has a problem with it, so that it that it always outputs a zero or it always outputs a one. So we call that a stuck at zero or a stuck at one fault. And uh, there are certain ways you can you can set things up to test this without having to exhaustively test. So let's say you have, um, well, let's see, this is a good example. So what you do, you create a test pattern that basically causes the output to be something, something the wrong value if there's a fault present. So for instance, if we want to test a stuck at zero, then what we would do, we would create this AND gate to output a one. Well, you do that by putting three ones in, say if it's a three input AMP gate, so you make A, B, and C, all ones, and you expect a one out. If it's stuck at zero, you get a zero out. So that's a really robust test for, for testing that. Then you have this stuck at one. So if the AND gate always outs, outputs a one, regardless of its inputs, then that's a stuck at one fault. Now, uh, we can test that with one pattern here, where you just have a zero, one, and a one, zero for A, but one for B and C. But obviously to test it, it, it to test it completely and thoroughly, you would, you, you could have, uh, you might have to have seven different, seven different tests to show that. Because obviously anything but one, one, one should produce a zero, right? I mean, anything but one, one, one should produce a zero. So, uh, so we're only giving one of those possible seven zero tests. And so it's possible that we'll miss uh, we might miss a problem because it might the the A line say might be good, but the B and C lines are bad. Well, we wouldn't necessarily know it through this test, but we would know it's not you know we would at least know it's not stuck at one. Um, and then this would test the stuck at zero. Uh, okay, same with the OR gate. Uh, although here, you to test the stuck at one, you put zeros into everything, and to test the stuck at zero, you put just one one in. Again, there could be a problem with input C or B, which we wouldn't detect this way. So we don't necessarily employ an, an exclusive uh, set of input patterns. We just pick one that would give us a, a, a different output if the, if the whole gate was stuck. And we sort of count on the fact that, it, that it's probably not going to be just one input. It's probably going to be the whole gate that's stuck. Um, so we have a stuck at zero, stuck at one. And we create patterns that are going to give us, uh, if if it is stuck at zero, then we won't get a one out, and if it is stuck at one, we won't get a zero out for this pattern. All right, and you can see if this input goes from one to zero, we expect the output to go from one to zero. If this input goes from zero to one, we expect the output to go from zero to one. So that's how we're. So that's how part of how that we do this testing is we do the transition, and uh, as part of this transition, we transition one of the inputs. We we expect the output to change, and if it doesn't, then we know we're stuck. Same thing here. If this transitions from zero to one, we should get a transition from zero to one here, and if this transitions from one to zero, we should get a transition from one to zero here. All right, so if we want to uh, if we want to apply uh, exhaustive testing, you'd have to have 512 different patterns 
for this because you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine inputs. Okay, so as you can see, 512 patterns, that, that's a lot of that's a lot of patterns to go through. And look, these aren't even complicated circuits. Three AND gates, three three input AND gates, and one three input R gate. That's that's a lot. So what we do instead, we try and create uh, a, a set of patterns that will, to some extent, uh, exercise the circuit fairly well to eliminate these stuck at conditions. So, so one of the problems is we don't really have access to these internal signals, right? So we have to control these internal signals by using these inputs over here. And so we, in this case, we have these two AND gates sending a zero, only this AND gate sending a one, and we change this input from a one to a zero. And what do we expect? We expect the output to go from one to zero. So that's one test. And then um, that tests that this AND gate is not stuck at one, and it tests that this OR gate's not stuck at one. And when you work it all out, so we have uh, we have the uh, these A0, B0, C0, and P0. So basically, uh, we're testing. Uh, so we're we're going to test. Yeah. So we're so we're going to test. These are here. We're testing our stuck at zeros. Here we're testing our stuck at ones. And now notice, first we're we're testing we're testing this transition from one to zero using this first AND gate, A B C is one, and then we go to A is zero. Well, and we make this transition. Here we go. Then, then we have D, E, F are, are one. And here we have G, H, I are one. So that's that's three patterns here. And that tests our three input AND gates for whether they're stuck at one or not. Okay. And then that also... Uh, it also it also tests well if, if one of these is stuck at zero actually what this test is it tests these AND gates to make sure they're not stuck at zero because you won't get a one out if any of these are stuck at zero for these three tests and then it also it also tests though that uh, that your OR gate is not uh, stuck at zero. Then we have three more tests where we, we put in the pattern 0, 1, 1 and we change that 0 to a 1. So that proves that this AND gate is not stuck at 1 because it has to transition. So if we get a 0 out initially we know that this AND gate is not stuck at 1. And then when it transitions we know that our OR gate is not, not stuck at 0. Okay, so these six patterns do a pretty good job of of assessing uh, the, these these overall circuits without having to run all 512 patterns. Now, it, have we exhaustively tested it? No, we have not, but we have ruled out stuck at zeros uh, and stuck at ones uh, at some level of granularity. And of course, if you have more time, you can do more testing. You can add more patterns. But but this is this is a you wouldn't just want to do a random any old pattern. You want to do a thoughtful pattern that uh, that exercises each of these gates uh, at some level anyway. Okay. So that's what about for sequential logic? So this is combinational logic. Now what about sequential logic? Okay, so this is a lot more complicated because now we have to first go through a series of inputs to get us into a state, unless we can directly set or clear the uh, the our our register that holds our state uh, our state, and 
that probably isn't possible. So we find that uh, the testing sequential logic is a lot more complicated because now we have to we have to uh, actually step through a series of states to get to the state we're even interested in testing. So clearly, testing sequential logic is going to be a lot tougher problem. All right, so here's an example. Here's our state graph. We have four states, S0, S1, S2, and S3. And uh, we're going to put in this sequence here and expect this output sequence. And here's our, here's our flip-flop state encoding, Q1, Q2. So 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. So we've kind of switched. Um, well, kind of. I don't know. Anyway, uh, however you want to interpret this. But this is the order. And state S0, state S1, 2, and 3. Um, I think we you could say we list them the other way and then they're in binary order, or you can say well, they're uh, not quite in binary order, and that's fine. Okay, so then we have, these are the desired next states, given these inputs, x0 and 1, and our outputs, given x0 and 1. Okay, so here's the output. So what we're looking for now is we're looking for this distinguishing sequence. Okay, so uh, so basically, what the distinguishing sequence does for you, it it shows you um, uh, it it shows you what state. Uh, well, it's gonna it's gonna put you in all four different states, no matter what state you start in. And it will also tell you what state you started in. So basically, uh, you let's say you're in S0. You put in the sequence x equals, x equals 1, and then you put in x equals 1 again. And when you do that, you you go to S1 and then S2. And when your your output would be 1, 1, and the state uh, and the state and the state that you're in would be 1, 0. Sorry, uh, 1, 1 for 3. You'd be in S3. Then let's say you're in S1. You get a 1, you go to S2, and you get another 1, now you're in S3. And in S3, you're going to output 1, 0, and the state you're in is 1, 1. Let's say you're in state S2. You go to S3, and then on a 1, and then on a 1 from S3, you go to 0. Now you output 0, 0, and your state number is 0, 0. And finally, let's say you're in, uh, let's see, did I do all three? I guess I did all, all four. So basically, no matter what no matter what state you start in, if you input 1, 1, you can distinguish uh, what state you're in. You know that you're in S0 because uh, you're going to wind up in state uh, 0, 1. If you started in uh, S1, you're going to wind up in state 1, 1. And if you, wind, and if you start in S2, you're going to wind up in state uh, 0, 0. And if you're in S3, you're going to wind up in state uh, 1, 0. So, yeah. So this, this is a way to, uh, this is a good way to test it. So no matter what state you're in, you put in 1, 1, and then you can tell if it did the right thing. Okay, so here's an example. Um, so, so we can have this functional test for a sequential circuit. So we want to verify the transition from S0 to S0 or S0 to S1. So, um, so so what we do is, so we put in our we put in our sequence here. Um, again, our distinguishing sequence is one one. So then our output should be. So our so if we're starting in zero, our current output will be zero. And then, so here we are, we get a, x is 1, so we get an output of 0. We're in, state S, uh, uh, we're in state S0. We get an output of 0. And then we move to S1. In S1, on a 1, we get an output of 1. And we move to S2. 
and on a 1 and S2, we output a 1 and we go to S3. So our output is 0, 0, 1. Uh, our initial output then is 0. Okay, so, so this is kind of tricky and it's easy to get confused here. But let me, let me see if I can explain this uh, in a way that it makes sense. So this distinguishing sequence, the way this works is we're going to try and set up transitions. So, we're, so the first thing we're going to try and do <coughs> is we're going to start in state S0 and we're going to put in a 0. So we're in S0. We put in a 0. What should happen? Our input x is 0, so we should stay in S0. Okay, so what is our output? So our first output for x equals in S0 for x equals 0 is 0. Now the next thing we're going to do is put in 1, 1, which is our distinguishing sequence. And that's going to tell us whether or not we went from state S0 successfully to state S0. So we're verifying the transition from S0 to S0. So we start in we start in state S0 and we put in an input x of 0. That should transition to S0 with an output of 0. Now we're still in S0. We put in the 1. That, transi that transition is to S1 with an output of 0. And now we trend and now we put in another one, should transition us to S2 with an output of 1. What we see on our output then is 0, 1, right here, 0, 1. And that proves that when we issued the 1, 1, we were in S0. So that means on this first 0, we did correctly transition from state S0 to state S0. So that's what we're verifying. Okay, let's verify the transition from S0 to S1. We're in S0, and we get a 1. That's going to put us in S1. Now we issue our our two-digit distinguishing sequence, 1, 1. The first one takes us to S2, and we put out a 1. And the second one takes us to S3, uh, sorry, takes us to S3, and we put out another 1. So, our, so we put out 1, 1. So our first one is a 0, and then we put out 1, 1. So our distinguishing sequence gives an output of 1, 1, which, which if we go back here, means that we are in state S1 when we issued the two 1, 1s. Okay, so that's great. That's what we wanted. So now we've proven that we went from S0 to S1. All right, well, let's check the next one. We want to check S1 to S0. Okay, so we start in state S0 and we put in a 1. That puts us to S1. Now we're in state S1. Now we want to go to 0. So we put in a 0. That brings us back to S0. Now we put in our our distinguishing sequence 1, 1, and we should get 0, 1 out, which is, again, back to here, S0. Okay, now, that's fine. Now we want to verify S1 to S2. Okay, so we, we go we we go to, from S0, we start in S0, we put in a 1, that puts us in S1. And then we're in S1, we want to go to S2, so we put in a 1. So that's our second one. Now here we should be in S2. We issue our distinguishing sequence, which is 1, 1. And our distinguishing sequence returns 1, 0, which if we look here, is S2. And so forth. We go all the way down and say, let's let's check S2 to S3. Actually, I guess we did it twice here. S2 to S3, yeah. So we're, we're in state 0. We put in a 1. That puts us in 1. Now in state S1, we put in a 1. That puts us to 2. Now in state S2, we put in a 0. That takes us to state S3. So here we are in state S3. Uh, and we put in our distinguishing sequence, 1, 1. And that's going to tell us if we're really in S3. So 1 puts us to S0. 
and another one puts us into S1. So our 1, 1 is going to put out, for S, for this S0 transition, it's going to put out a 0. And for our uh, as, and for S0 to S1 transition, it'll put out a 0. So we should get 0, 0 as our sequence. And that should verify that we were, in fact, in S3. And if we go back and look, yes, we see 0, 0 stands for S3. So, so we execute all these. We get ourselves. We always start in state S0. We move to whatever state we want to be in. And then we transition to the state that we're testing to see if the transition is going to work. And then we put in our 1, 1 distinguishing sequence and see what those last two outputs are. And they're going to tell us if we were, in fact, what state we were in when we issued the 1, 1. And here, let's say S3 to S0. So we want to see, so so we, we give a 1, puts us in S1. Another 1 puts us in S2. We do a 0, puts us in S3. And actually a 1 would have 2. And then we do a 1. That 1 then should put us back to S0. So now we're in state S0. We issue the 1, 1 and see what we get. We get 0, 1. That proves that it worked correctly. We were, in fact, in S0. And so that's how we use our distinguishing sequence. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. It is kind of confusing. All right, let's talk about scan testing. This is a little more, uh, this is a little less confusing. So, uh, so typically the way we do scan testing is we, we often have uh, two port flip-flops that are set up with two totally different clocks. Our standard system clock is SCK, and that's what's normally operating this device. But when we're in testing mode, we, we, we use TCK, and that's our test clock. And usually in that process, we're going we're gonna to somehow stop the uh, SCK, or, or the TCK is going to take precedence, basically. And so what happens then is we're able to, uh, we're able to tick our test clock, and our test clock then is, is, going to, um, is going to use this second input here, D2, and we have this serial data in, serial data out. And so what we're able to do, we're able to, we're able to shift in, and we're able to put into this flip-flop, say, 1, and tick the clock. Now it's in. Now Q is a 1. Now Q is going to pass over to here if we tick the clock again. And so we can basically just pass our inputs through N flip-flops and preload them with the exact pattern we want by by uh, by using the test clock, and then we've what we've done. Then we've set all these flip flops up to hold exactly the pattern we want, which could theoretically then put us into whatever state we want to be. This is another way to do scan testing. Um, this is a, this is our scan chain, and uh, and we can pass this along through a whole bunch of combinational blocks. And we, we can use the test clock to basically uh, to basically walk our uh, walk our serial data line in and through all these flip flops, and that enables us then to put a pattern into the internal parts of a of a say an integrated circuit so that we can actually test the logic that's been programmed in and see if it's going to work correctly. Um, we can also do this with multiple ICs. Every IC has this serial data in, serial data out, and this test clock. And what we can do is we can daisy chain these things and uh, and just uh, uh, and shift in then whatever complex pattern we want in each of the ICs. We just have to know how many how many uh, toggles of the test clock it's going to take to get all the way through this chip and into this one and all the way through this chip and into this one. And we call this we call this uh, oftentimes we'll, we'll, this will be set up as a boundary scan. Now this is a little different. Uh, in this case we might have actual internal flip-flops being set up. But in this one we use the IO the IO ports and we're able to have this test logic this uh, tap controller we call it. Uh, the uh, test access port controller. And what we do then is we have a, uh, a test clock and we have a 
test data in, test data out, and a reset. And uh, and I forget what the TM oh, uh, and the test mode select. And typically, then what what gets done is we'll shift in all the uh, information we want into each one of these outputs. And uh, or we can actually uh, run the chip and we can read all these various outputs by shifting the information out and back and and back into the tap controller and then from here it can go back into uh, uh, whatever computer we're using to do this now uh, one of the ways you can actually program the the chip on your board is to use this uh, is to use the JTAG boundary scan and there's actually a setting on your pins and you can and if you had a JTAG programmer, you could in fact uh, program your chip using the JTAG programmer using this boundary scan thing, and it's an IEEE standard and all that. And uh, and it just it, it allows you to uh, to get access to all these uh, these uh, these boundary cells on all your pins, so you can read the values that the chip's trying to send out to all the pins, and you can also put values in all the pins, which is a way of actually programming inputs. Uh, so the boundary scan is used fairly extensively. One of the things you can also do with the boundary scan is you can typically read uh, what chip you have here, and it's that's also a very nice feature. Uh, and you can you can actually there'll be uh, you can read that information out of the, uh, the the tap controller. So you can have several integrated circuits on a fairly die uh, fair, uh, on a on a on a printed circuit board, and you can use this boundary scan to uh, to test this board. And again, that's called the Joint Test Action Group (JTAG). So it's a JTAG boundary scan, and uh, and what it does, it it shifts the data from these uh, these cells connected to all the pins, and they're typically bidirectional. Some are inputs, some are outputs, uh, and you can shift this this data out. You can read the outputs. You can put data into the inputs, um, and you can you just shift it along using this uh, test data in, test data out, uh, and the test clock. Built-in self-test. So this is really a very a very typical. Um, uh, this is more. I think this is the future really of testing. As our chips get smaller and smaller, more and more powerful. Um, Doing some sort of externally imposed testing is going to be more and more difficult and more and more awkward. Uh, so a much better way to go is to have the chip, uh, just when you design your circuit, you build into it a set of test exemplars and the circuitry to present these exemplars wherever you want. Because now you're designing the circuit from the ground up. Uh, whether it's a FPGA or whether you're doing a, an application-specific integrated circuit, you can you can put connections in to the to the deepest uh, internal architecture that you have, and you can you make it so that you can present various patterns to your to your internal logic, and see if you get correct answers out. And you can make these moderately complicated, although obviously you don't want this testing to take forever. But uh, you know, but it could take a short amount of time, and you can set it up so that it always runs on power up, or you can run it at other times if you wanted to. And the and this self testing then uh, generates the test pattern. This your circuit then processes the test pattern and outputs uh, the outputs, which are then uh, monitored by the test response monitor, and then that's uh, sent back into the the built-in self test controller. And that then evaluates whether the test, the self test, was successful, uh, or whether it failed. And obviously, if it fails, then it then it would notify uh, the user or the system that this chip uh, has not tested uh, correctly. And then you can decide whether you're going to abort, uh, change, you know, fix the chip, whether you're going to do more testing or what. Uh, and I think I think you'll see. I think we will see as time goes by that this is more and more and more and more typically what how how integrated circuits are going to work. They are going they are going to ha mostly have built-in self-testing because it it's it's the one way where you can really uh, get access to anything you want to test, and you can you can 
have a standard set of exemplars which you run through and which gives you feedback on whether or not uh, the device is operating properly. Now obviously there's no such thing as a perfect test and you can't you can't wait five hours every time you power something on for it to be somewhat exhaustively tested. So you still have to carefully pick your test uh, patterns so that uh, so that they're they're exercising your system uh, fairly well, but obviously not not exhaustively. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I think at this point, I think I'm going to stop here, uh, and then we may finish this up uh, a little bit on Wednesday, and then talk about uh, um, the um, upcoming test. Let me just pull that back up. So uh, we may we may do a review for the uh, second written. Note that the second written is not actually due until the 13th of. November, of, of November. So you've got a ways to go. Two weeks. A little more than two weeks, actually. So not to panic. Okay.